good morning participants and we will start our webinar within five minutes so we are waiting for the studio sir once he joined we will start our event
to be a bit less. Okay, sir. Can we wait for next uh, four minutes? Ah, four or five minutes. Let's. Uh, dear participants, we will start our uh, sessions uh, at eleven ten. Please stay to. One gaji sir. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are audible. Now. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir.
sir uh, surya sir can we start sir yeah please sir okay uh, namaste good morning all on behalf of nidm i am gautam junior consultant for js and evoc welcome you all to today's webinar on emergency operations center organized by national institute of disaster management ministry of home affairs government of india before we start our webinar i could like to convey my sincere thanks to shri taj as ips ad and uh, professor surya prakash sir head gmr division and cbr industrial and cyber dr division nidm minister for affairs government of india delhi for giving this opportunity to conduct this webinar so without late i will set the background of today's webinar the emergency operation centers serves a critical role in every phase of emergency management from being the hub for all coordination during an incident to facilitating and directing recovery however the evoc does not manage an incident it coordinates various situations which will trigger the evoc's opening including emergencies that requires resources beyond what local capabilities can handle lengthy crisis situations when major policy decisions will or might be needed when a local or state emergency is declared and when the evoc's activation will be advantageous to successful management of an incident to mock talk more about these topics we have joined with mr ajit batham sir vp nidi mh and dr raju tapas sir technical officer emergency management vh cdc india this webinar aims to share and disseminate experience knowledge and information on emergency operations center before starting our technical session i uh, request professor prakash sir head gmr division head cbr industrial and cyber dr division he was also faculty in charge of eight specialized centers therefore center on early warning communication uh, safe hill area development coastal disaster risk reduction and resiliency emergency operation center flood monitoring cell cbrn industrial drr and cyber drr he also nodal faculty for nine central ministries for coordinating disaster management activities including ministry of petroleum and natural gas coal new and renewable energy communication mines shipping labor and employment parliament affairs northeastern states to set the context of webinar with his thoughts so with this i like to invite sir professor sir the floor is yours uh thank you gautam ji am i audible sir you are audible sir okay good morning to all the distinguished experts delegates and participants of today's webinar focusing on emergency operation centers emergency operation centers are a very critical link in terms of our uh, preparedness and response to disaster situations because these are the entities which are vital in nature and uh, provide critical services in crisis and emergency as well as disaster situations uh, the concept has been driven from uh, the implementation of the incident response system in which the various stakeholders their roles responsibilities and uh, operational procedures have been well defined besides the institutional framework which has been set up by the disaster management act 2005 in terms of the disaster management authorities at the national level state level and the district levels Uh, these uh, authorities have been actually equipped and strengthened with the formation of the uh, executive committees uh, which are actually as advisory bodies and uh, supporting uh, you no know, entities for these authorities in terms of the important uh, ministries departments who have to play a significant role in disaster risk reduction and resilience besides that at each level if in every district with every dm authority there is an emergency operation center to establish communication coordination and collaboration activities in disaster situation these are very important operations and activities that need to be uh, taken up very efficiently in order to reduce the risks and enhance resilience of the population affected by any specific or multiple hazard now uh, these uh, how do these uh, emergency operation centers function what should be the infrastructure and 
what is the minimum database that they must have at their disposal immediately to connect uh, the concerned authorities as quickly as possible so that the actions to be taken against disaster situations are not delayed. That is one part. Other is that people should know where to report in case they actually witness or observe any kind of disasters in their area. So these emergency operation centers, they were earlier given two important four digit numbers, which included 1077, which was there for the district emergency operation centers, and also 1070 for the state emergency operation center, as well as National Emergency Response Center. However, with the emergence of the new technologies and techniques, as well as developments in the field of disaster management, we have come across common alert protocol at the global level in which a specific number to be dedicated for the emergency and disaster services. Earlier, uh, the number 108 uh, was quite popular, which integrated 100, 101, and 102 for police, fire, and ambulance. Now, in order to integrate all other uh, related services to disaster management, the common alert protocol has uh, given the number 112, like the 911 in US. In India, we have 112. Uh, which is a common alert protocol cap number which through which we can access all the relevant important departments related to disasters and routine emergencies and crisis situations so now uh, that is one part which uh, has to be actually shared with uh, through the emergency operation center and connected with the masses as well as media and the concerned technical organizations for the purpose of disaster management. These EOCs are also very well linked with the early warning and communication systems as well as dissemination of the early warning forecast uh, related to different disasters. So now uh, these uh, EOCs will serve as vital links uh, with the people, with the uh, concerned uh, disaster management authorities, as well as the technical agencies from where they will get the information and on based on which the actions will be initiated. So all these uh, being important, then um, how should they make their communication redundant by virtue of having multiple types of communication systems and devices, be it the landlines, telephones, mobiles, wireless sets, or the satellite phones, as well as video conferencing platforms. All these are being used. Besides that, uh, some of them are also equipped with hams, which can communicate through the ionospheric uh, layers at the times when all the landlines, the towers fail and uh, the communications become difficult in any disaster affected area. So the, what should be the minimum equipments that uh, the emergency operation centers must have in order to uh, make the functions as the coordinating, communicating and collaborating centers for the concerned DM authorities to share and disseminate the important messages, required resources, the requisition, mobilization, and demobilization, as well as uh, the uh, uh, no, uh, press information to be shared with the masses through the media. So number of responsibilities for these uh, and their functions have been defined for the emergency operation centers our uh, distinguished experts will be sharing how these uh, emergency operation centers are functioning at the different levels and what can we do 
to strengthen them uh, to uh, deliver their responsibilities more efficiently with the state of art technologies. So uh, the Honorable Prime Minister through his uh, 10 point agenda on DRR has also emphasized on utilization of state of art technologies for the purpose of DRR. So all these steps uh, very much important and the follow up actions which are required to be taken up uh, in order to uh, know, pursue the goals, objectives, priorities and the targets under the Sunday framework on disaster risk reduction and resilience which was decided from 14th to 18th March 2015 for the next 15 years from 2015 to 2030. So we are all uh, part of the systems and uh, until and unless all citizens are made aware, informed and prepared against disaster situations, we will not uh, succeed in achieving our goal of the national policy which was released on 22nd October 2009 in terms of zero casualty, disaster free and resilient nation. I wish all the best to the speakers, the delegates and the participants of this program as well as the organizing team, the coordinator and the host of this program. So wish you all the best, safe, healthy, good quality life on an equitable, justifiable and right based manner with good fraternity amongst all of us. And as Vivekanandji has said, this single episodic webinars may not serve all the purposes. So we have to continue and sustain this process uh, as was uh, told by Vivekanandji, arise awake and stop not till the goal is achieved. So we have to continue and sustain and make this process persistent until and unless every citizen is aware, informed and prepared. So we have to develop this culture and this is what is also part of our goals under the national policy. And so I wish all the best to everyone. Thank you very much for providing me this opportunity to express my views on this occasion. Thank you. Back to you, Gautam Ji. Sir, thank you very much, sir, for setting the contest and the enriching the knowledge of our participants on the theme of our today's webinar on emergency operation centers. Uh, so, uh, moving to the our technical sessions, uh, there will be a two presentations and each speaker will having a 40 minutes to share uh, their experience and knowledge and there will be a also question and answer in session uh, where our experts will be resolving the doubts of our participants. Here yeah, participants. Yeah, participants, please note that you can source your questions there is in a, a chat box and a question and answer section. And also, please make sure that uh, attend and pay attention to the sessions to claim the certificate from NADM training portal after this webinar. So, so without late, I'd like to introduce our first speaker to our audience, Shri Ajit Badam, sir, in professional NADM. Uh, he has done his BTEC in electronics and communication, and uh, he also did his uh, MBA in disaster management. He has several years of experience in the field of disaster management and also worked with the government of Delhi in the capacity of project officer in the two district disaster authorities. And previously, he was also posted in the Delhi disaster authority headquarters, Department of Revenue. He is currently engaged as a professional in Central for early warning and communication in JMR division at NITM. So with this, I'd like to invite Shri Ajit Batam, sir. Sir, the floor is yours now. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me in this webinar to deliver a session on emergency operation center. So, uh, yes, now I'm going to share my presentation. Please let me know if it's visible. Uh, yes, sir, it is visible. Okay, so is it on full screen now? Yes, yes sir. So, once again, I would like to uh, show my sincere gratitude to the organizing team, uh, Professor Surya Prakash, uh, sir, and uh, EDNIDM, 
for giving me this opportunity to deliver a session on emergency operation center in this particular webinar. So, <clears throat> uh, in this presentation, I'm going to uh, give a glimpse of emergency operation center and how the concept of emergency operation center come into existence and then how uh, it is uh, useful for the various uh, district authorities or various line departments who are working in the field of disaster management and also what uh, uh, what valuable equipment should any emergency operation center should have so i will explain those equipments as well so let's start this this, uh, this session so So first of all, if you if you if you want to understand emergency operations center, then let's uh, understand first the meaning of emergency operations center. The first uh, word that comes is emergency. So if uh, we if we define emergency, then an emergency is a situation that uh, possess an immediate risk to health, life, property. Or environment <clears throat> so we can define emergency like this and uh, or we can say an unforeseen combination of uh, you know, circumstances of the resulting state that calls for immediate action or an urgent need for disaster or an urgent need for assistance or relief so uh, this is the meaning of emergency now if we say operation the operation or organized procedures to bring <clears throat> people or uh, person out of danger and from any attack, harm, or any other thing. So we can say a planned activity involving many people performing various action. This is how we can define an operation. Now, similarly, we talk about a center then uh, the point from which an activity involving many people performing various actions so the emergency operation center can be defined as a center which is looking after the which is looking after the rescue operations or any other operation in the wake of any disaster or emergency so Yes, it is also uh, an off-site facility, you know, which will be functioning through state headquarter or district headquarter, and which is actually an augmented control room having various communication devices and space to accommodate various uh, officers from the various, uh, uh, sorry, uh, to accommodate the officers from various line departments, or we can say emergency support functionaries, so it is uh, the uh, or we can say the physical location where the coordination of information and resources to support a disaster normally take place. We can call it as an emergency operation center. <clears throat> so here I would like to uh, pay your attention here that. Uh, There is a guidelines issued by National Disaster Management Authority on incident response system. That guidelines uh, came in the year 2010. And why I'm mentioning it here? Because uh, the concept of emergency operation center is, uh, you know, is comprehensively explained or used in this uh, particular guidelines uh, on incident response system. So, uh, I mean, I, I will also give a little uh, glimpse of uh, what is incident response system. So let's understand that uh, this is the organization, uh, I mean, incident response system organization, where you can see there is the responsible officer uh, uh, who, is, who is the lead officer. 
and then there is incident commander and subsequently there is the information and media officer safety officer deputy and deputy incident commander license officer okay and there is also some branches uh, on, or we can say some sections like operation section planning section and logistics section so uh, basically this irs organization is the is a is a team comprised of uh, uh, no officers of various line departments who already know their roles and responsibility okay and they they work they work accordingly with their uh, roles and responsibility that had that has been assigned to them as per this incident response system organization chart okay <clears throat> so uh, the upper body is called the command staff and the lower is the like general staff this is uh, uh, in, in an overall picture of uh, IRS organization. So here you can see this operation section, planning section, and logistics section has also various branches. So when a big, uh, large level disaster took place, then this organization activated through state or if we or uh, um, by the district administration. Of the concerned district okay so uh, this irs organization also when this irs organization activated then the role of emergency operation center also you know okay uh, also come into uh, picture so here we uh, the previous slide we understood the emergency sorry uh, the incident response system organization and how you see support that irs organization so now if we talk about uh, emergency operation center the hierarchy of emergency operation center in india so as far as uh, i work with the you know, uh, various uh, district administrations, I mean, district disaster management authority and Delhi disaster management authority at the state level as well. So what I have seen that uh, the hierarchy of EOCs can be defined like this. I mean, uh, at the top level, there is a Ministry of Home Affairs control room, and then it, then, then it is uh, connected with the National Emergency Response Center control room. They both are interlinked, okay? and both the uh, control rooms are connected with the National Disaster Management Authority control room. Okay. And NDMA control room is connected with the with each SDMA of uh, the entire of the entire country, that is State Emergency Operations Center. And each state emergency uh, state emergency operation center is connected with the their concern, district emergency operation center. And uh, in some uh, districts, uh, there are also subdivision wise EOC. So each district is connected with the, this uh, subdivision wise EOC as well. <clears throat> so this is how uh, we can understand the flow of information. I mean, uh, sub, uh, information in case of any disaster flows from down to up, like. Uh, if if there is a, if there is any mishappening or we can say if there is an accident took place or any disaster or any emergency situation which is needed to be uh, needed to be informed to the higher authority then the information flows from the subdivision wise eoc to the district emergency operation center then they are informed to the state emergency operation center and similarly the information flows to uh, NDMA control room and NERC, then MHA control room. So this is how uh, um, <clears throat> information pertains to a big disaster uh, received to the Ministry of Home Affairs control room. Then subsequently action taken place. So this is the, uh, uh, in the previous slide, the we have seen the IRS organization as I mentioned that the it, it has been activated by the district magistrate of the 
concerned district. So this is the trigger mechanism uh, when uh, when state control room or we can say state emergency operations center receive uh, some early warning through various agencies, like uh, in case of uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> in case of suppose in case of uh, uh, cyclone, then there is a early warning through IMD. So those uh, early warnings will be you know communicated to the state control room or we can say state emergency operation center, and they communicated and they will communicate those information or we can say early warning to the district emergency operation center and district emergency operation center will inform to the district magistrate of that concerned district <clears throat> and if uh, uh, and if a district magistrate magistrate thinks that the uh, incident response system should be activated then he has the he has the rights to you know, activate this incident response system organization or we can say the incident response team. <clears throat> now, these are some functions of uh, emergency operation centers like surveillance. So, in the in case of uh, any disaster, they basically they provide the 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 executives who are present in the emergency operation center who are rendering their duties in the emergency operation center they actually uh, gather all the information and provide the big picture to the incident response team who are working at the incident site so yes they keep surveillance they keep their eyes on the incident and we can say that the surveillance that uh, incident and provide a big picture to the um, um, to the uh, rescuers. The second is information management, strategy, policy support. So yes, uh, at a time of disaster, there are so many information that, that are keep coming to the uh, to from the various uh, way of uh, media. So, in though in, in that case, EOC those who are present in the EOC and take uh, they take a chart of information, and they ensure that the what information are relevant and what are not relevant. So they keep those relevant information, and it will it helps to make uh, to you know to to to, to create some strategy. At the field level, at the incident site level, also resource mobilization and allocation. So uh, when, uh, as I said, that they, they provide a big pictures. That is, they have all the information and with with them available. So what resources are needed to be mobilized to the incident site? It it is very now it is very easy to understand, and uh, hence. The EOC can also uh, help in resource mobilization and the, their allocation as well. Interagency coordination. So at the time of uh, that disaster, any big disaster, there are so many agencies that come together to work for to to deal with that uh, disaster situation. Uh, so at that time, it is uh, very important to have uh, interagency coordination. So here. Emergency operation center also plays a vital role to make a uh, coordination between all the agencies who are come to work for a uh, rescue and relief operations. Also, inter jurisdictional coordination, like if there is a border dispute. Uh, so, here also, emergency operation center plays an important role. Uh, planning and preparation of plans. Uh, and training as well. Uh, these are some uh, these are some EOC norms like uh, should be followed. Like uh, one senior administrative officer should be should should be appointed as uh, in charge of emergency operation center, 
and who must be having some experience in the disaster management as well also representations uh, representatives of all the concerned land department uh, with authority to pick mobilize their resource should also be present at the emergency operation center adequate space should also be there at the emergency operation center to accommodate uh, these officers who are coming from various land departments also communication facilities uh, that provides last mile connectivities and a vehicle uh, should also be there uh, with uh, mounted with the high frequency very high frequency and uh, <clears throat> other equipments uh, communication equipments uh, also representatives from various central teams like ndr farm force uh, should also be you know uh, should also be deployed at the emergency control room in case of uh, a big disaster and disaster management plan of all land departments should also be available at the emergency operation centers disaster management plan of the state and district uh, should also be available at the emergency operation center directories with the uh, emergency contact details well well this is the very basic thing for the emergency operation center like directories and also connectivity with all the district headquarters and police uh, stations and uh, yes database of uh, ngos working in different geographical area should also be available uh, in the emergency operation center because they they really play an important role in the wake of any disaster like they 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 come forward to provide you know uh, relief like relief materials like they all they they help in providing food drinking water and another another uh, things that are required uh, for affected uh, to uh, required to uh, 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 affected peoples also uh, demographic details of the state and district uh, uh, should also be available or we can say the maps uh, should also be available at the emergency operation center so these are some geo hazards like the volcanic eruption earthquake and landslide tsunamis and as no avalanche so in, in in these disasters emergency operation centers also play an important role and uh, just for the knowledge i put this link now just uh, some <clears throat> valuable equipments if you talk about some value although uh, there should be there should a lot of equipment should be available at the emergency operations but what i think some valuable equipments are uh, in these days like amateur radios or uh, uh, satellite phones we said so if we talk about the amateur radio then amateur amateur radio okay let's move on. so amateur radio uh, this is the need of the hour what i think so if we define amateur radio basically it is for emergency communication so in the in the event of major disasters emergencies it has been experienced that the amateur radio has worked successfully when no other communication worked the word amateur implies the use of radio communication for non non commercial purpose and uh, amateur radio operation does not use the ground based infrastructure this is the very plus point for this and has limited power requirement that is electricity requirement and uh, which can be easily met by batteries and generators and therefore work successfully in emergency so those ham radios and amateur, amateur radios really work successfully in the emergency in the in in if if uh, uh, we understand in more uh, deeper way than the amateur radio wireless telegraph station license issued by ministry of communication is the only license that gives uh, uh, the privilege to a citizen of the of a country to communicate around the world 
using a personal two-way radio communication device in frequency allotted to a particular amateur radio service. As the license holder are uh, are people from different background and departments scattered around the country, so they are in a position to establish a countrywide emergency communication network in the event of large scale disaster. Also, the existing government uh, radio uh, communication channels are suitable only uh, for uh, uh, intra departments, that is, within the same department's communication. So, there are many operational lim limitations of inter department radio communication. Uh, radio communication among the different uh, uh, departments like you must have seen that uh, if, if uh, uh, a police uh, if a particular police uh, station is using a frequency then that frequency can uh, that frequency can only be used by the uh, police department as only it can't be used by the other other departments. So this is the limitation of the you know uh, interdepartment interdepartmental radio communication. But in case of amateur radio, no such uh, limitations exist. Also, uh, it is self reliance. Self reliance like Like uh, government uh, wireless equipment installation are maintained by professional engineers. Okay, but in the event of a disaster, urgency, disaster or an emergency, their support may not be readily available okay, uh, to the wireless user. But uh, in the in case of ham radio, operators are self-reliant and they decide on their own. To improve upon or uh, rectify a fault as well. So now, the second thing that comes is the uh, so now the second thing that comes is satellite phone. <clears throat> so a satellite phone, telephone, satellite phone, or set phone is a type of you know a mobile phone that connects to other phones or telephone network by radio through obtaining satellites instead of instead of terrestrial cell sites as cell phone do. So the advantage of set uh, satellite phone is that it's use it's not uh, that its use is not limited. To area covered by a cell tower, it can be used in most or all geographic location on the Earth surface. So, reason to get an emergency satellite phone is like uh, first you can say for your safety and peace of mind. Also, uh, it, it can be used to seek help. It can be used in this stay stay in touch anywhere anytime. Also, uh, it is very easy to use. I mean, it should not take a lot of time for first time user to operate an emergency satellite phone. Even though it uses the most advanced and modern technology, it works just like a regular cell phone. So almost all satellite phone comes with the with a user manual to help you set up your satellite phone. So this is why we, we should uh, we should recommend satellite phone for emergency operations center as well. So now uh, it comes on the V set communication that is very small aperture terminus uh, communication. And uh, if you talk about VSET, the inherent nature of VSET communication via satellite and connectivity advanced make VSET the ideal means of communication during any emergency. So during disaster, the first action should be uh, to connect the affected site to multiple other sites, and this can be done quickly using this uh, VSET. 
So satellite communications and in particular the VSAT system have an important role to play in disaster recovery and emergency response. So a VSAT is a device known as a small private earth station that is used to transmit and receive data signal through satellite. Or VSAT stands uh, for very small aperture terminal and refers to uh, receive transmit terminals installed at the dispersed site connecting to a central hub via satellite using small diameter antenna dishes. And VSAT is also used for both broadcast and interactive application of effective data, voice, and video transfer as well. So why why um, I'm recommend the why uh, we said is recommending because the dish is very small it's it's uh, dish is very small easily transportable and installation lead time is much shorter if compared to terrestrial links and we said network allows rapid low cost network uh, reconfigure and expansion to meet new and unexpected business requirement it is also cost cost effective transmission and there are also uh, many advantages that VSAT offers. Uh, some of them are like the service charge depend on the bandwidth, which is allocated to network in line with your requirement. Uh, VSAT terminal price are uh, also falling these days. So no last, um, if you are using VSAT, then there is, uh, uh, you will not feel no last uh, mile issue. There is no last mile issues. As it is mobile, so it is used for short term or emergency communication, excellent for broadcast transmission as well. So this is the uh, this is uh, uh, here you can see a structure of uh, EOC established in the Delhi Disaster Management Authority. Well, I worked in Delhi Disaster Management Authority. So here I'm just uh, presenting the the how they are connected, how district emergency operations center is connected with the state emergency operations center. So here you can see that your MHA control room, which is also connected with the national emergency op uh, national emergency response center that is NERC control room. Then NDMA control room is connected with the state emergency operations center of Delhi, and Delhi has eleven districts, and all the eleven districts have there. District Emergency Operation Center like South Delhi, Southeast, Southeast District Delhi, uh, Southwest, North, Northeast. So these all are the uh, districts uh, in Delhi. And these all uh, districts have their District Emergency Operation Center. And those are connected with the State Emergency Operation Center of Delhi, which is situate, uh, situated at the uh, Civil Lines area of Delhi. So how state emergency operations Delhi, uh, operation center Delhi works? I'm just uh, just for your kind information so that you can understand how this emergency operation center work during any disaster occur. Suppose uh, incident took place at the uh, Sheikh Sarai area that I have mentioned incident at the Sheikh Sarai. Then the person will call to the state emergency operation center as in the inaugural session, Professor Surya Prakash informed you all that. Uh, uh, um, 1077 and 1070 are the emergency operation center number if you are calling to a district then it is 1077 and all the state emergency operation center have their uniform number is 1070 if a person is calling uh, to 1070 then it will land to the state with code enable of Delhi then it will land to the state emergency operation center Delhi. then the executive who are present who is present to the at the state emergency operation center Delhi, he will ask these four questions to the caller, like caller name, caller number, incident type, incident address. Okay. Once uh, he'll he uh, get all the information, he'll he'll quickly identify the location, and uh, so, since they are they all are very trained, so he'll quickly uh, assess uh, the uh, quickly find the location of Sheikh Sarai. So Sheikh Sarai comes under the district south delhi so immediately that call will be forwarded to the district emergency operation center of south delhi this is how uh, the emergency operation center works in delhi 
and this is how emergency operation center uh, supports iras so here you can see so in the pre, uh, in the first two slide first two three slide if you remember i spoken about the incident response system and i also informed that the emergency operation center plays an important role uh, uh, when uh, we talk about incident response system organization because uh, and the guidelines which are issued by the ndm as uh, of iris organization as a you know, role of emergency operation center as well. So uh, it ensured a common operating picture, as I mentioned, that it provide a big picture to the responders. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> they also provide relevant maps to the authorities and to the uh, rescue, to the, to the incident response team who are working at the incident site. They also provides a policy called clarification and managing conflicts. If there is some <clears throat> jurisdiction uh, conflicts between the two departments, or they of, or, and if there is some jurisdictional coordination issues, then they also provide some policy clarification in those situations. They also support resource mobilization, as I mentioned in my previous slide, like. Uh, <clears throat> They assess the situation and inform the all the uh, procedures to the uh, senior officer who is present at the emergency operation center and accordingly the resource mobilization done they also provide communication messaging reporting support uh, reporting support to the uh, uh, to the incident response teams uh, also, uh, those who are working at the incident command post, or you can say the incident site, the uh, emergency operations center also provide them a weather forecast. They also brief VIPs, like uh, uh, as I said, that the, all the information management done at the emergency operations center. So once they get all the information, and if any VIP is coming to, uh, to to know what has happened, then the officials who are present at the emergency operations center brief that uh, VIP for, as, as per the information received. And uh, strengthen the interagency collaboration. As I said, that uh, there are various agencies who work together in the wake of disaster. So uh, EOC strengthen their interagency collaboration and also they help in support decision making. So uh, you don't need to be confused when I talk about EOC and IRS together. That's why I put some differentiation here. Like if you talk about IRS, then it, it is an on site management system. Okay. Uh, while EOC is an off-site management system, uh, IRS it is temporary in nature. I mean, if any, if any disaster happened, then it's up to the district magistrate if he, whether he wants to activate their uh, activate uh, their uh, incident response team or incident response organization or not. So it is temporary in nature. And in case of emergency operation center, mostly it, it is a permanent setup and could be temporary. Uh, IRS, it involves in tactical management, like uh, most uh, of the IRS organization, tactical organization, like uh, tactical management, like on, on field management. And uh, if we talk about EOC, then it involves in strategic supporting management. So IRS, it uh, under the direction of responsible officer that I mean this organization work under the direction of responsible official and under the, the uh, in case of EOC it uh, they work under the uh, direction of a specific agency. So IRS also manages specific incident or event. But when we talk about emergency operation center. They may manage multiple incidents simultaneously and other disaster management functions as well. 
So these are uh, some contact details, uh, emergency contact details like National Emergency Response Center contact details, so Ministry of Home Affairs Control Room, National Disaster Management Authority Control Room number is also there, and Emergency Response Support System that is 112. It is, uh, you know, uh, you must all know about the 112. So, also a state emergency operation center of Delhi also mentioned here. So these all the these are all the emergency contact details. And this is all about my presentation. So, uh, Mr. Gautam, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I hope uh, I did justice to my presentation, my topic. Over to you. Thank you. Sir, thank you so much for uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, taking time for us to deliver a uh, training session on the emergency operation operation center. Uh, sir, with your permission, uh, can we wait for a couple of minutes to audience to post their questions? Okay. Uh, I guess there sir, is a question. Only one question is there, sir. Prashant Kumar. It is what is the role of AI, artificial intelligence in EOC? He suggests. Uh, so artificial intelligence, yes. Uh, I guess uh, it has not only in EOC, but yes, these days artificial intelligence is playing a very vital role. So, but uh, in my view. Yes, artificial intelligence can be used in EOC to disseminate uh, various uh, to disseminate uh, you know, early warning to the uh, people. Like uh, we can say, it can be used in delivering mass messages to deliver uh, early warning. And so, in my view, yes. Uh, this is how uh, artificial intelligence can be uh, used. In. But as far as my knowledge, I these days it, it, it is not in very much uh, in active mode. But yes, in the coming days, I, I guess artificial intelligence will be uh, using in all the emergency operation centers. Sorry, uh, any case study uh, no, uh, but you can find you can search it on the NDMA NDMA website. Uh, you can you can go to the NDMA website and there are uh, there there are details of all the emergency all the state emergency operation center of India. So hopefully you can get some data over there. Sir, uh, one second on behalf of NADM and the participants, uh, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to you for joining with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we are moving to our uh, second technical session. So I'd like to introduce our second speaker to our audience. Dr. Raju Tapasa is currently working as a technical officer, emergency management at Delhi for VHS CDC India. Prior to this, he was working as a junior consultant at the Early Warning and Communication Center, JMR Division, NIDA, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. Before joining NIDA, Dr. Tapasa was associated with the two different major projects sponsored by the Department of Science and Technology, Science and Engineering, Research Board and Nuclear Sciences Department of Atomic Energy independently. Dr. Raju Tapasar has published more than 50 publications in some of the leading journals under the publisher of Elsevier, Randran Francis and Springer, including publications in national and international conferences, seminars, etc. Dr. Tapasar has conducted more than 100 webinars, online training programs, in-person training programs, etc. 
Dr. Rajat Thapasar has also contributed to developing one training model on communications for disaster management at NDM. With this, I'd like to invite Dr. Rajat Thapasar. Sir, the floor is yours now. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I hope I am audible and visible. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, after such a wonderful session, uh, from Ajit sir, uh, highlighting all the basics of uh, emergency, you know, as, uh, EOCs, emergency operation centers. I think uh, my work has been done very, see, it has eased my work. So I will try to uh, present my slide. Uh, just uh, one second. Uh, is my presentation visible? Yes, sir. Uh, is it full screen or uh, half screen? Full screen, sir. Okay. okay. So, uh, so like sir said, uh, very nicely under under highlighted the concept of uh, emergency operating centers and how it is implemented and how it is used and its uh, with other technical parts also, particularly for disaster management. So. Rather than repeating what sir has already said, what I will be focusing on a little bit different concept that is the emergency operations that is for we have also because we do have to have witnessed and we have everybody has witnessed that during this uh, COVID nineteen period particularly what we have seen is an you know a need for an integrated approach. Approach where the uh, public health management so come to one. We had also, and also the, 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 uh, when we were finding so difficult. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, your voice is actually is breaking. If you have some internet connection, so you can switch off your camera and you can continue. So. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. Is it is it okay, better now? Yeah, it's uh, now clear. Okay, so what I was saying is that uh, during this uh, COVID-19, what we have seen is that uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, the leak of information, the lack of coordination. We have seen it in several places. So uh, to, to overcome that also, these emergency operation centers can play a very important role. So particularly um, public health emergency operation centers, which are focusing on the, uh, the key points of public health, that can be a very useful role in such. And uh, it is not that it has been not talked of or it is not, uh, it has not been given importance. The government of India has realized the need for a sustainable, you know, resilient public health infrastructure and program. Uh, the, the public PM Abhin that we call the PM Abhin that is Prime Minister Aishman Bharat Health Infrastructure uh, Mission. Uh, under that, uh, it, it has been it has been focused on strengthening the national public health institutions in extending the integrated health information platforms the ihip uh, and organizing several public health units also and the establishing of public health emergency operation centers or that we call phgocs and uh, when you talk about this shift from the uh, response driven operations uh, sustainable resilient public health infrastructure. So uh, what we are focusing is that um, strengthening of the National Center for Disease Control, NCDC, where five new regional NCDCs and 20 metropolitan health surveillance units are being proposed. Apart from that, the expansion of the integrated health information portal to all the states and the union territories so that we can have a connected system where all, the, all of the India is connected to a central health hub so that the information, the, the, the exchange of message, the exchange of the expertise, the exchange of logistics, the exchange of administration, the different component of IRS, which Ajit sir has said, that can be, yeah, you know, met uh, faster. So this is the point. Apart from that, um, the uh, what other point is also important, the operation of 17 new public health units and strengthening of 33 existing public health units at various point of entries, that is including the particularly airports, seaports, land border crossings, all has been set up and setting up of 
15 health emergency operation centers similar to public health emergency operators, it has also been prioritized. So uh, this is just to give you an idea that our government of India is, is taking steps and, that, and it, is, it has also prioritized its actions towards uh, PM Abhim and setting up and also making the concept of public health emergency operation centers so that uh, uh, we can bring this to the masses and we can uh, execute as much as uh, what we are planning. So like uh, Ajisa already highlighted what is an uh, EOC, in very similar line, we have public health emergency operation centers. So this PHEOC that I will say from here on is a, you can, you can say is a physical location that integrates the traditional public health services into the emergency management model uh, for the command, control and coordination that is required to respond to emergencies that involve the health consequences and public health threats. So as you can see, it, it, it has its lead component, it has its contract tracing. During COVID-19, I think all of you have heard of this, or, you know, the terminology, contract tracings. It, it, in, in this component, it, it is very important to have a very good medium of communications, effective and you know, rapid communication medium, apart from that uh, respective action source. And this uh, you will see, it will coordinate information and resources to supply incident management activities you know, that uh, Ajit sir was highlighting. So why have an PHEOC? Why do we need PHEOC? So uh, the first is like to support the decision makers in the accomplishment of their task uh, in achieving, you know, uh, in, uh, in to, uh, what are the tasks of the decision makers to provide the capability to receive, analyze, display, and monitor information related to public health that is going on, to be able to identify, to be able to organize, to be able to display, and also track resources. What, what resources do we have to tackle those situations? Apart from that, also it will help the decision makers to be able to communicate also, to coordinate, and also collaborate from, from a centralized location so that in all of the states, all of the UTs that we have in our country, they are in, you know, reachable. They are in, 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 con in constant coordination with each other. And also these actions are very, very crucial, uh, you know, crucial for an effective uh, pandemic response, like we have seen during COVID-19 and the next uh, PHEIC or the Public Health Emergency of Internet, I mean, the monkeypox that followed. Though um, the monkeypox hasn't spread as much as the COVID-19, but uh, this is where the EOCs can play a very, very important role. So, what does an EOC do, particularly PHEOC? Already, uh, we have talked about it. This I'll just say when you talk about public health agency, they are responsible for the strategic or the operational functions, particularly uh, overview, particularly overview of the response to particular pandemic or any other activities. Normally. Uh, it, it does not directly control field assets. Some of the, but you can say some of the common functions that includes by PHEOC is that it will collect and analyze the information that, that is there. It will make decisions that protect the life and property. Particularly, you have seen during COVID-19, how important it is to have a good decisions, how important it, has to, uh, it is to have a right decision, right information at the right time. So for all that, and PHUC can do that and it can maintain the continuity of the organization. It can disseminate, uh, you know, discussions to all concerned agencies, individuals, officials who are there. And, and you will see that in most of the EOCs, there is one individual in charge, in which uh, we have already learned, and that is the emergency manager. He looks after that so that we have one point of contact and one manager who is managing the entire incident. So this uh, EOC organizational principle that we are talking about, it will provide a management structure uh, that results uh, in better decisions and more effective use of available resources. And uh, it, it is also designed for incident and response that may involve multiple agencies and political jurisdictions, like we have said, seen in, uh, in uh, what you can say the COVID-19. What we have seen is that, uh, the, though we were having a pandemic, 
we were seeing that uh, just when Ministry of Home Affairs was taking the lead role in, in coming out with the guidelines, in coming out with policies, in coming out with the instructions, right? So what we have seen is that uh, it is not that only the Ministry of Health and Family Affairs was concerned. It is, it, whenever it comes to a country level problem, all of the ministries, they come together. So we have multi-agencies, we have multi, you know, uh, multi-stakeholders, they can be from different states, different countries, different nations, district level, and right up to the community level also. So we have different uh, stakeholders, all of that, it, it means we need to incorporate everybody. So that's why we need to, we need to design such that our incidents and our response. And it should be modular, uh, our, uh, our EOC, PHEOC that we are talking, it should be modular, modular in the sense, based on the incident that we are dealing, it, it should be able to expand or contract as incident grows or end. Because um, when you are dealing with public support, uh, public, uh, pandemic, which was at a global level, the response, the response needed may be different, uh, so the modular size may be different. But when we are dealing with suppose and site an incident that has a particular suppose a fire incident that is taking place only one particular area the size of the you know the incident management team it may be different so that's why we say that the whole concept the principle that uh, that it remains the same but it should be modular it should be it should follow the uh, minimum span of control it should be modular and other principles that that applies to any uh, in irs in, in any EOCs. And these attributes that we are talking about, they are very, very critical for the dynamic, for the politicized, and high impact nature of the COVID-19 response that we have seen. It is very, very important. And we, we need, we must say, we must congratulate our, our leadership that despite being such a huge population, we have somehow managed uh, to some extent the COVID impact that other countries have faced. Our country somehow it still managed that. So there were many, uh, you know, uh, cases, first wave, second wave, there were many learning lessons, but we took that learning lessons and we implemented that and we came up with a very strong strategies, which has also, you can say the the approach that our government had of the people centric and the, the, the community centric and the people first approach, that was one of the success, you know, successful pillar that was there in our response approach. So this IRS or IMS for any PHEC day-to-day -day operations and management, uh, it has already been discussed. So well, uh, I will just skip this slide. Just it has number of component in, in it. So each has a different different unit, which has a different different role. And this uh, PHEOC that we are talking about, it can be dedicated PHEOC or it can be a multi-purpose PHEOC. Dedicated PHUC means uh, those facilities are generally found at a national level. You have a, a separate, you know, dedicated space that is allotted to you. Uh, you you have a staff that is there who who comes to that, um, you know, infrastructure and use that infrastructure for for a better uh, uh, in, in a given system for better coordination and cooperation. Or you can also have a multi-purpose PHUC. Multi-purpose PHUC means this PHUC functions is often dual or multi-purpose. That means uh, the infrastructure or the area that is allotted for the, this PHUC, it is used for other activities also. That is not related to emergency preparedness and response. So this, this is like a temporary, you can say temporary locations. Uh, you can have or you can have a temporary location. This uh, this uh, multi-purpose one, you can work when there is when you are on a war foot, you know, uh, when you are in a war zone, when you are in the actual. Uh, in middle of a response, then that can be act as a POTC when you are in a peace time. So when there is no suppose peace time, when there is no COVID, at that time it can be used for trainings and capacity building. So uh, this uh, this um, multi-purpose POTC, the space is converted to POTC whenever it is required. So um, there are various components actually that are very very essential for 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 POTC to be successful. The left side of the slide that you can see, it shows four components of PHUC, that is plan and procedure, data and information, a physical facility or location equipped with technology, and skilled trained personnel and requirement for establishing and operating functional units. And uh, at the right side, you will see 
three handbooks on and that are published by WHO for the developing and PHGC. If you are planning to develop, there are already three handbooks. Uh, the handbooks consist of three separate documents uh, where part A covers the policies, plan, and procedures, the part B covers the physical structure, the information, and technological system, and the part C covers training and exercises. And this POC, PHEOC can also be a you know a various types depending on at what level it is operating. Suppose type A is a, like like you should have the capacity to manage a subnational. So you can say at the district level uh, EOCs, the state level EOCs, or national level EOCs or international EOCs at the international level, right? So based on uh, the intensity of the uh, you know the incident that you are managing. All that it can depend. It can depend so which type of EOCs is activated, and based on the need, based on the what is the need of the you know what is the staff needed, what is the you know, what is the infrastructure that is needed to deal with that, what is the capacity or the uh, capacity of the human resource that is required to deal with that. All different type of EOCs can be activated. These are some of the examples just to just to showcase like uh, stood up for a single response, very small response or a coordinated multiple response or a national uh, international response, you know, different EOCs, you can have a different level of EOCs. So question might always arise that why do we need PHUC for public or EOCs for public health? As Prime Minister uh, in 10 point agenda on disaster risk reduction in point number nine, it has been highlighted that we must make use of every opportunity to learn from disasters and to achieve that, that must be studied on lessons after every disaster. So similarly, we shouldn't miss any opportunity and the lessons that we have learned from COVID-19 that can be implemented to strengthen our emergency operation centers for public health so that in future, uh, in future upcoming pandemic, because uh, Based on the, the things that is going on, you can say the climate change, the urbanizations, uh, the the interactions of human with animals day to day. Since since our, our, our the population of the you know I will say globe as a global village, the global village is expanding. The, uh, you know now this village when it come uh, when it come in contact with uh, animals, uh, every time new new disasters. New, Emergencies may arise. So, up for any upcoming pandemic, we must be prepared. So, the, this this pandemic is a, is also a learning opportunity for us. So, what where we went well and where we went less well. So that can be also and uh, also lack of SOPs and interoperability for managing a health crisis. It has been observed that there is you know for interoperability of public health with disasters or any other uh, department that we need to have a more effective SOPs. So that there also it is needed an absence of comprehensive views of potential health preparedness, absence of a common platform for monitoring and preparedness, where everything can be you know seen, absence of a single source of truth of uh, you know for a health data set or even the absence of common health standards and health index. All that also you know, make it realize that we need to have a EOC for public health. And one more thing is that uh, this uh, this uh, EOCs for public health it will provide information and communication technology tools and services that will help to manage, to coordinate, and also to collaborate together with the emergency response efforts. And uh, to achieve the um, you know India is a signatory of IHR 2005 International Health Regulation 2005, and to um, uh, and to address those emergencies that have health consequences. Uh, member states needs to establish or improve their emergency operation center to strengthen communications and coordination for effective health, public health response. So this is where we are uh, heading also. And uh, way forward that we need to talk about is that we need to develop institutional capacity for staff, for staff, and for the system also. So that PHOC regarding uh, public health preparedness and response to achieve the mandates of IHR 2005 and to address the uh, the emergency that has health consequences be done. In addition to that, uh, uh, we need to enhance the capacity to to receive, to analyze, to display, to report, and also to share uh, daily situation reports during peacetime and other reports of you know reportable and unusual disease. And health conditions 
from uh, from uh, EOCs during wartime. And uh, also, we have to understand that we need to strengthen response plan that contain verified locations, contacts, and emergency response information for international, uh, you know, uh, IHR focal point, WHO IHR contact point at POE. POE is point of entry. Uh, EOCs, when we are talking about public health EOCs, it is also very important that uh, we need to have an effective EOCs at point of entry also. Mm -hmm. During, uh, I think, uh, during COVID-19, it has meant that um, it is not that, uh, that some disease that has uh, initiated or started at one, we take the example of pandemic. It started at Wuhan, China, and then it spread it throughout the country, right? So if we have a very effective EOCs that can stop uh, uh, some contaminations from entering our country, right at the point of entries, the three point of entries we have, that is airport, land, bo land border, and also uh, seaport. If we can stop this from entering our country right at the point of entries, then you, you know we, we can we can achieve a sustainable progress in saving the life of our country fellow fellow beings so that's why it is also very also very important to strengthen eocs particularly at poe when we are talking about public health emergency operation centers and also we need to ensure the procedures and equipment are in place because without the proper equipment it is it will be very difficult to fight and uh, an enemy which you cannot see with our, you know, naked eye. You know, sometimes virus, COVID-19 uh, virus, you cannot see, you cannot, anything unless you cannot see those virus, it is very difficult to fight against those. So that's why we need to ensure that we have the proper equipment we are, that are in place and uh, proper uh, system is there, proper uh, facilities is there. And, uh, and, uh, and we also need to ensure that uh, that we maintain communication between the IHR focal point and also WHO regional office so that if there are any communications that needs to be coordinated between them, that can be done. So uh, in the end, I would like to end my presentation saying that uh, with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, it has now demonstrated that no country is immune to public health emergencies. And uh, this point make it very obvious that why we need an emergency operation centers, particularly focusing on public health. So with that, I would like to stop my presentation here and back to you, Gautam sir. Sir, thank you so much, sir, for taking time for us to deliver a training session on concept of public health emergency operations center. Sure. Sir, can we wait a couple of minutes uh, for audience to put the questions? Yes, yes, please. So, uh, dear participants, uh, if you have any questions, queries, uh, you can put in chat box. Uh, just, just one question I have seen that about the uh, about the case studies or something, right? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, yes. So, the, I will just like to inform uh, the participant that uh, previously uh, we have conducted several webinar series, uh, NIDM, uh, NCBC, and CBC. In that webinar series, if you go to NIDM YouTube channel, and you go there, there is particularly one webinar on uh, public health emergency operation centers. There we had uh, several experts who, had, who shared their experience. We had, uh, you know, experience sharing from Mumbai EOCs and also from, uh, we had experience sharing from uh, Uttarakhand PHEOC. So that can be very useful and very, you know, uh, enlightening also how uh, at the topmost level, how the EOC functions, what are the initiatives that are taken, what are the points that have been considered before taking any you know, uh, initiatives. So that can be a very good learning lesson. So uh, that you can go to an item that, that I, I definitely hope that that will be a useful information for all of you. Sir, one more question is there in chat box, sir. What role you envision for the student community? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, regarding uh, EOC or uh, no? It is uh, not due to the EOC. It is studying what role you envision for the student community. Uh, so in general, I would say uh, first and foremost thing that a student can do is be aware, right? Because there are uh, not much. I would say uh, the the what the, uh, the administration power. Will, but what you can basically do is that you can be aware 
the very basics and you know necessary things for any person to make a difference is to uh, is to be aware of the issues right that is the uh, I, I will say the first point i would like to suggest and if you talk about uh, second point i will say that uh, like start with small efforts you may think that uh, like being at this level how how my initiatives will make any difference it's absolutely wrong even small small uh, initiatives make a very big difference so making a different doesn't a difference doesn't mean that necessarily doing something you know extravagant or even the um, smallest thing can help uh, contribute to society so um, uh, example of making small efforts in daily lives are like say anything uh, donating blood uh, feeding the hungry donating small blanket anything anything that can be done that is very important for us um, spread awareness the information that is uh, delivered to you or the things that you have learned from here you can also further disseminate diet to your parents or to your families to your loved one to your friends that can be also spreading awareness is very very important uh, also engaging uh, educations be volunteers you know uh, showing initiatives and efforts towards uh, things that are important and voluntary voluntarily for us uh, for the same is also sometimes makes very different and particularly uh, student volunteering you know uh, suppose uh, at, for uh, an orphanage or old age home food or any other any other help that can be a, a initiative in journal if you say that, so all this can be done back to you uh, sir, thank you sir as of now there is uh, no questions from the participants once again on behalf of nadm and participants i could like to convey my sincere thanks to you for joining us with us today thank you so uh, uh, okay just i will uh, just one final message i will say that uh, if you need further information about phgoc and if you, if you are still having a questions like how in india this uh, this eoc is being done yes. uh, how it is maintained who is looking after that if if this type of questions are still there in your mind i will just ask you to go to uh, website and just look for ncdc national center for disease control uh, they are the nodal agency who is looking after that. In NCTC, we have uh, IDSP, Integrated Disease Surveillance Pro uh, Program. We have IHRP. So you, you will find various type of uh, systems that is there. And it will be very, you know, uh, enhancing knowledge process for you. So I will also request you to go to NCTC websites and see some of the information out there. So thank you, Hari. Uh, thank you, uh, Gautam. Back to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So, uh, dear participants, uh, this is the end of uh, our today's uh, training session. Uh, before concluding uh, our session, I once, I, once again, I like to convey my sincere thanks to Sri Tajasan, IPSED, and Professor Rebecca, sir, head GMR Division and CBR Industrial and Cyber DR Division in IDF, and also my heartfelt thanks to Ajit Badam, sir, and uh, Dr. Raju Tapas, sir, and also the other panel members and participants. A very special thanks to IT section of NIDM who is working with us behind the curtains. We will meet again uh, in our other training programs. Thank you for all of you for joining with us today. Jai Hind.